So thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge that this meeting is being hosted on the traditional lands of the Bindal and Wulgurukaba people and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And since it is an online meeting, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work and um, celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal Australian people um, and their ongoing culture and connection to the lands and waters that we work and live on. Now, our expectation is that interactions during this seminar are constructive and that all attendees behave uh, with respect and consideration uh, towards each other. There is a chat box in which you can type your questions and comments, and um, these will be answered um, after the talk, or I can unmute you at the end if you raise your hand. I think you might be able to even unmute yourself and ask your question directly. Okay, so um, it is my honor to present today's speaker, uh, Professor Misha Metz, who is joining us from Northern Russia today. So thanks very much, Misha, for getting up early to give this seminar to us. Um, Misha is a full professor at the University of Texas in Austin, where uh, he leads a lab uh, that looks into how reef building corals adapt to environmental changes, including climate change on a genomic level. Um, now, Misha has been uh, a regular visitor to Townsville and has been doing coral spawning work basically since the age of heroes, um, initially on Magnetic Island from random Airbnb kind of places, and later on at Orpheus Island Research Station. And um, his initial interest was not so much applied, it was more uh, just um, pretty basic um, sort of unapplied molecular ecology questions related to corals like fluorescent proteins and their roles in um, uh, sort of light uh, uh, tolerance in corals. Um, and later on his interest uh, turned towards adaptive mechanisms in corals and, and how the coral genome underpins adaptation. Um, I, I had the privilege to work with Misha for a number of years now, and um, I can tell you that he's one of the most uh, entertaining and inspiring people to work with. He's one of those um, truly genuinely curious scientists who inspire by their passion for discovery. And so his field trips are always extremely fun and I guess somewhat chaotic. Um, but but very productive. So he comes with one idea and uh, on the fly comes up with a couple other projects and also sees them through. So Misha is a very prolific uh, scientist with a high number of citations and publications, including in journals like Science and other high profile journals. Um, OK, so today Misha is going to tell us about um, his and his lab's research on how epigenetic mechanisms may or may not play a role in adaptive responses in corals and especially in transgenerational adaptive responses. So um, I guess I, with that, I will pass on this virtual microphone to you, Misha. You want to take it away? Yes, Greg Ski, thank you so much for such a great introduction. I've been blushing here. You probably saw it or even heard it through my microphone, me blushing. And I uh, Yes, uh, and thank you all for actually showing up for this, <laughs> despite the adversities and despite the weird timing. I greatly appreciate this invitation at all. Uh, so, oh, one thing, since there are so few of us actually attending, please do uh, ask your questions right away, just speak up. I mean, uh, Greg can probably unmute you or you can unmute yourself and just ask questions right away. The presentation is not terribly long, so there should be enough time. Excellent, thanks. <laughs> Okay, um, uh, does gene body methylation play a role in adaptation? You probably heard that uh, if the title of a talk contains a question mark, the answer is usually no. Uh, <laughs> it's going to get a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, in our case, as you will see, so like I'm trying to build the intrigue here. Before we actually launch into actual stuff, uh, let me acknowledge that the main driver of this project is uh, Groves Dixon, who is now uh, left us for the dark side. He is now a bioinformatician at Moderna. Good for him. Uh, and it was funded by uh, NSF. Okay, so epigenetics. Sounds like magic already. What is it? Epigenetic modification is any covalent chromatin modification that changes gene function without changing DNA sequence. 
Okay, uh, but why is that suddenly more exciting for everyone than, say, uh, transcription factors binding to their promoters and regulating gene expression? Well, the reason is that this whole notion of epigenetic inheritance, which is the, the magic which everybody expects epigenetic to do, what I mean by this is that some authors believe that, including myself at some point, I'm, yeah, I probably don't believe this anymore. But uh, yeah, at, at least at some point, I really uh, believed that, that uh, epigenetic modifications can do the following. They can be adjusted according to the changes in the environment, like purposefully in a regulatory fashion uh, to accommodate uh, the new environmental changes. So these adjustments do help acclimatize to environmental changes. Those are not some random changes happening, right? It's just like the changes purposefully to acclimatize the organism to new environmental conditions. And well, uh, most likely uh, by affecting gene expressions, like everything is uh, getting sort of through gene expression to some extent. Uh, and finally, and that's the most magical bit, is that those adjustments, uh, unlike uh, transcription factor regulation, which would basically, the first two would fit transcription factor regulation, but epigenetics is uh, assumed to be passed on from parents to the offspring, such that the parents learn something in their lifetime and they can pass on this knowledge to the offspring without the change in DNA sequence. How awesome is this? So it's inheritance of acquired adaptive characteristics, the idea which harks back to good old Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, pre-Darwinian evolutionary thinker who thought that things evolved by use or disuse of organs, like giraffe trying to strain his neck, and inheritance, of course, of these acquired characters, which are like you train something and you pass this entrained thing to uh, the next generation. Okay, so if the previous slide works, then Jean-Baptiste Lamarck might be uh, as ridiculous as it sounds, it might be at least partially correct. Uh, and we might be actually missing a big part of the evolutionary picture. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, let's look into this. Okay, what we're looking at of all possible uh, epigenetic modifications, we're looking at DNA methylation, simply because that's the honestly the easiest one to look at and probably the most likely one to be inherited. It's an addition of the methyl group, methyl group, that's CH3, uh, moiety to cytosines. So uh, first thing first, there are two kinds of DNA methylation. Uh, one which most people heard of, including many marine biologists, is methylation of promoter regions of genes, which uh, represses gene activity. Okay, this is a very well characterized function. However, it's specific to vertebrates. It's not found anywhere else in the tree of life. It's a vertebrate specific thing, okay? Promoter methylation. What is common to the tree of life with the exception of prokaryotes is so-called gene body methylation, which is methylation of coding regions and exons and introns actually to slightly smaller extent, but whatever is transcribed is methylated. The function of this modification is currently unknown. So, uh, let's see if we can say something about this function. First thing first, if you just look throughout the genome in any, pretty much any organism, this is coral, but uh, all organisms are like this, uh, and see which genes end up being more methylated and which genes are less methylated. On the x-axis on this graph, uh, we, basically it's a methylation level. It's high methylation towards uh, the right and low methylation towards the uh, left. And these are the distributions of genes assigned certain gene ontology terms, basically gene functions. So there is a group of strongly methylated functions and weakly methylated functions. And uh, all the genes, basically, if you plot the methylation levels, they fall into uh, two humped histograms. There are two kinds of genes, basically, which can be summarized very simply. Housekeeping genes, which are used all the time, always on, usually highly expressed, are strongly methylated. Okay, so highly expressed genes, continuously expressed genes, housekeeping genes are strongly methylated. And then there are context-dependent genes, 
which are needed depending on the situation. They get switched on and off depending on what the environment does and what the organism does in terms of, I don't know, development, signaling, recognition of things. Those are methylated weakly, and that's it. The biology, and yeah, this is a very universal thing. As I mentioned before, uh, people looked at this sort of distribution of methylation levels across the tree of life, and it's always like this, including, by the way, uh, vertebrates. In vertebrates, this thing kind of gets obscured by, by additional overall methylation of the genome, but gene body methylation is still there and does the same thing. So, um, uh, suddenly, biology is uh, sounds extremely simple, and that's where the meme for the talk is. There are only two kinds of genes in this world, my friend, from the point of view of uh, methylation machinery. Housekeeping and context depend. Ha. Huh. The question still stands. Okay, this is what you find in uh, in the genome uh, of a any animal if you just sequence it and see where the methylation marks are. The question still stands, is it actually changeable? Is it adjustable depending on the environment? Because that pattern emerges not through the environmental influence probably, but through evolution somehow. But does environment affect this sort of pattern in any way? That's a big question. So the big question is for my, for, to prove that epigenetic magic is actually working, does environment affect GBM at all? And if yes, does uh, the change in GBM correlate with gene expression? Do they contribute to between population divergence and are they heritable at all? So those are very important things to establish that ma magic works. And uh, the, oops, the paper uh, that we published on this matter not so recently, but relatively recently, uh, was uh, basically due to great efforts of Lena Bay from Ames. Uh, this is the experiment which she performed, transplanting a bunch of Acropora millipora corals across five degrees of latitude. Uh, this is the experiment. If you can do reciprocal transplantation experiment for your career, do it now. Those are things which keep on giving. We published like three papers out of this one. So this is the third. And uh, uh, that's where we actually look at gene body methylation in conjunction with gene expression and fitness of things. So they were transplanted for three winter months and long story short, there were fitness differences. They grew differently. So the environment was different. Uh, but what happened to um, gene expression and GBM? If you compare uh, the direction, uh, the change, uh, of uh, in GBM, depending on direction of transplantation, of Orpheus to Keppel, Keppel to Orpheus. You expect things to be reciprocal. You expect things to be negatively correlated. It changes one direction if you transplant it to Keppel's and changes the opposite way if you transplant it to Orpheus. Yeah, overall, we do see some sort of reciprocal change. There's cl clear uh, negative correlation here, highly significant, even though the R squared kind of sucks. But uh, it's clearly a tilted cloud right there. So there is opposite, there is some sort of consistent environmentally induced changes. Uh, if you compare GBM with gene expression, you can see that GBM is much tighter, which basically reflects the fact that GBM really doesn't want to change compared to gene expression. It's very, very stable. If you uh, partition the variance and see how much of the variance is explained by uh, genotype, just what sort of uh, in individuality of the coral that you're transplanting. Oh, basically it's broad sense heritability. So it turns out that in GBM, almost 80% of all the variation that we see in GBM is just attributable to difference between individual genes. So it's highly genet specific thing. Very, very. Uh, actually gene expression, lesser known fact, gene expression is also quite genet specific. About 65% of variation is attributable to difference between genes. And that's a consistent thing about gene expression. Like, remember this for the future. Uh, but uh, GBM is much more stable. Okay, uh, what's going on with this sort of situation? Uh, actually, this is a very interesting thing that we noticed about this experiment. So remember there are two kinds of genes highly methylated and low methylated, forming these two humps in the histogram of the overall methylation levels. I'm just re redrawing it. So there are two classes of GBM, like 
arbitrary split histogram in two, low methylated and highly methylated. Cool. So what happens if we plot the changes in GBM uh, uh, against this axis? And what we see is this, we call it a seesaw pattern. What does it mean is that these guys are getting lower methylation and these guys are getting higher methylation. So basically the peaks of the histogram get closer together. It's a genome-wide signal. It's not a gene-specific signal. Clearly, this sort of thing is not regulation of individual genes. It's like overall pattern. Interestingly, this is, this is okay. This is Orpheus to Keppel transplantation. Now, what happens if we transplant corals from Keppel's to Orpheus? It's a completely different set of corals, right? Completely independent set of samples. And yeah, it's reciprocal. It, it's slightly less pronounced, uh, but it's uh, the other way. So basically the peaks of the histogram gets wider. The seesaw pattern. Wow, interesting. So how does that relate to uh, gene expression? Do the gene expression show uh, uh, seesaw pattern? Which is like, as I uh, mentioned, doesn't look like a gene specific response, like targeted regulation of certain genes to adjust for the, uh, for the environment. No, it doesn't look like it, right? So what about the gene expression? Oh, 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 I forgot to say, so, okay. Once we notice that these peaks are doing this in our experiment, now we basically uh, measured the distance between the peaks and looked at how much of the variation in total this simple parameter explains in our uh, principal component analysis of, gene oh, of GBM. It turns out it's nearly perfectly aligns with the first principal component and explains a whopping 33% of total variation. So all these points are individual coral fragments methylated up in the experiment. And the first principal component aligns with this difference. So uh, this GBM disparity between classes is the major determinant of natural GBM variation. Okay, okay. What happens with the gene expression? Gene expression, if you also, so plot it against the same axis, right? And you see where the gene expression change. Oh, look, there is actually also a tilt. Actually, interestingly, it's a tilt in the opposite direction. If we plot everything together, you can see that uh, these guys are uh, tilting this way and these guys are tilting this way, which means that GBM drops here and gene expression rises. So there is a negative correlation between a uh, change in GBM and gene expression. Hooray, is it? But the problem is if you really plot GBM change against uh, gene expression change, yes, the correlation is significant, but it's ridiculously small. And even uh, in one, yeah, or Orpheus to Keppel, it is significant and Keppel to Orpheus is actually not. So um, uh, yes, the correlation is there but it's so weak, uh, it cannot possibly be a, a biologically direct effect, right? Such that like GBM change directly affects the uh, gene expression change. It could be some sort of uh, third order indirect sort of situation, but it doesn't look like a regulatory behavior of things. But things are definitely happening. What's happening really? So, okay, the third prediction is that uh, these plastic GBM changes, if they reflect adaptation to the new environment, are supposed to get eventually fixed in the population and become the population specific uh, epigenetic differences, right? That's the idea of epigenetic inheritance. So, the plastic changes should transition into fixed changes eventually. And so, if we measure fixed changes between the populations, we can ask whether they parallel, they are basically the same as the plastic changes that we observe or not, then test this hypothesis. So here is our plastic changes when you uh, transplant Keppel to Orpheus. But if you look at the fixed changes, they are actually in the opposite direction. They are now positively correlated with the gene expression changes. And they are observed in genes which have high FST between the populations, which basically uh, tells us that 
the reason for this epigenetic divergence is actually genetic divergence or epigenetic divergence parallels genetic divergence. So we don't have evidence here of inheritance of these dynamic pattern transgenerationally. Okay, questions? So, wait, wait a second. So no, we don't have evidence of inheritance of adaptive traits, acquired traits. So sorry, Jean-Baptiste. Uh, to recap, we have observed the following. Gene body methylation is way more stable than gene expression and mostly varies between individuals, not between the treatments and stuff. Uh, second, gene body methylation responds to the environment in a genome-wide fashion, not in a gene-by-gene -gene specific fashion, by increase or decrease of genome-wide GBM disparity. This is the most unusual finding that we found so far studying gene body methylation. Uh, these changes are negatively correlated with gene expression, but this correlation is really extremely weak. And uh, these plastic changes do not appear to contribute to epigenetic divergence between populations, uh, which most likely arises through genetic divergence. Okay, um, do you have questions so far? I'm kind of halfway through the talk, uh, presenting the most data. If you think of something, please do speak up. Uh, uh, Misha, so, I, I actually do have. Yeah, Greg Ski. Yeah. Uh, so you said that uh, the housekeeping genes are always highly methylated. Yeah. Um, but then you also said that high methyl like high methylation results in low gene expression. So they're uh -huh. like correlated. So does no. That wait, 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 wait. Uh, uh, yes, in a dynamic. Yeah, in a dynamic situation, right? So. Yeah. Basically, uh, DNA methylation has different meanings. I, housekeeping. Uh, Greg, no, I, I don't. What what I'm saying is that uh, high methylation. You, we're talking about this situation. Uh, let's make sure that we really understand what's going on. But this situation, right? So, for example, for these genes, the methylation drops, but gene expression rises. For these genes, the methylation rises, but gene expression drops. But I'm not saying that this results in this. No, they are reflecting something which happens in the organism. They are not directly linked to each other. Otherwise, the correlation would be better than this. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. So it's it's yeah. uh, it's not a correlation. So, actually. Yeah. It's it's a correlation which is only significant because also. there are so many genes in there. Right. But it's like look at this cloud. It's barely you you don't see the tilt really. Uh, and in this case. Uh, the correlation is actually positive. If you compare the, the fixed differences between populations, uh, and yeah, there is a little bit of a seesaw tilt, but the uh, correlation with gene expression is uh, positive actually this time. Uh, so, okay. Okay, we, everybody's confused. Everybody's not doesn't know what's going on and what to think about this. Uh, to me, the most interesting finding is the overall high stability of gene expression and this whole seesaw uh, tilt situation. And that, that difference between the gene classes is the main determinant of uh, variation in nature, right? It doesn't seem like a gene expression process going on. That's what I'm kind of driving towards. So uh, we since then we've done some uh, in the COVID year when we couldn't do any new experiments. We just analyzed other people's data uh, and looked at other uh, studies uh, which had gene body methylation and gene expression measured in response to some treatment. And long story short, we could never find any correlation there. It's always a flat line. The uh, basically, gene expression does not correlate uh, with uh, gene body methylation change. The change in gene body methylation does not predict the change in gene expression. Mm -hmm. Even though, if you look at the baseline overall expression level, you have the housekeeping genes, which tend to be more highly expressed, and they tend to be more highly methylated. This correlation always stands, but this is not a dynamic change. Here, we, we are talking about Okay, we increased in methylation. Does it mean an increase in gene expression too? No, or decrease? No, you never see that. So this, whatever environment does to GBM, 
really does not result in change in gene expression. Okay. Um, also, you really don't find, I mean, sometimes people speculate that uh, uh, gene body methylation might be involved in uh, uh, specializing cell types or organs and development to basically uh, differentiate between different parts of the body, between different cell types. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, this is our own result in corals where we compare different types of polyps, which are very different in morphology and probably cell types. And we see no difference in uh, gene body methylation between them, even though there is a tremendous amount of difference between different genotypes, as we already seen in the previous experiment. Genotype differences rule and they are very solid, but uh, within organism difference are, well, we just don't see them. This is actually a growing realization of the past few years that GBM, gene body methylation, is actually not a regulatory mechanism at all. It, because it's neither necessary nor sufficient for gene expression change. Some uh, papers which were uh, published in addition to like our stuff is that uh, it does, GBM does change during development, but it does not have, uh, end up varying between the cell types. Cell types could be extremely different and it's been shown in, in addition to corals to in sea squirts, bees and uh, crayfish. Uh, yeah, huge differences in gene expression, no differences in gene body methylation between cell types. Uh, experimentally, people managed to completely knock out the DNA methylation enzyme, DNMT1 in uh, this bug. Right, and they observed no change in gene expression. This is the change in methylation level, and this is the change in gene expression, flat line. So if you experimentally knock out methylation, nothing happens to gene expression. Uh, and in plants, there are even such sophisticated things as epireals, which are uh, lines of plants are produced by hybridization between uh, two different subspecies where the genetics is the same, but methylation level is different across the genes. And you never see the uh, correlation of that uh, with gene expression in those lines either. So, okay, gene body methylation is not a regulatory mechanism. So what's going on? Why is it there? What does it do, <laughs> right? Uh, so, okay, hold on. Is it heritable? It looks like it is. So that's a good, good news. So um, mention, uh, I kept mentioning before that uh, gene body methylation is extremely variable between individuals, which already suggests that it's like, it's called broad sense heritability. So if the individual split into many fragments retain the same methylation level, this uh, means it's most likely heritable genetically. And for corals, it has been recently demonstrated, not in our paper, but uh, by, uh, group from KAUST by uh, Mania Randa and co-authors. Uh, very nice paper when they actually demonstrated that larvae of uh, corals um, uh, basically retained the methylation state from their parents. So that's okay. That's another myth uh, which most people have in their heads that methylation gets completely erased during gametogenesis and embryogenesis. No, it doesn't. It just doesn't. Right, uh, it stays. Uh, even more direct demonstration was with Nasonia wasps when they managed to cross the two different species and they managed to trace the methylation levels of specific alleles, whether they inherited from the mother or the father. And it turns out they completely retain their methylation state as in the parent. So this graph, uh, it would take me too long to explain, but this is a really good uh, paper demonstrating that uh, epi epigenetic state, gene uh, body methylation states in these guys is directly heritable, like allele by allele. So that's cool. Uh, it looks like GBM is basically a genetic thing, right? From that especially. It's not dynamic. It doesn't change with an individual. It's heritable. Methylated C is just another base. And that's our main 
idea right now. That's that's the thing we try to prove to everyone. So, uh, okay. Uh, of course, the question remains whether the newly acquired GVM states are heritable. So if uh, GVM is just a mutation process, which is, so whatever appears, it's supposed to be heritable. So I bet it will, it will be. So where we are with GVM total, what's the evidence? It's obviously linked to gene function on the evolutionary time scale. Somehow, highly methylated genes tend to be the housekeeping ones, which are used all the time. And low methylated genes are the context dependent, inducible. That's universal pattern everywhere. Uh, and yet, its removal, uh, its removal does lead to uh, uh, serious developmental consequence. So this has been done not only in bugs, but also in honeybees. If you uh, knock out the methylation enzyme, the development does get screwed up. So it somehow affects gene expression. However, it's not clear why, not clear what is the mechanism linking the uh, GBM level to organism function. It doesn't look like gene expression is directly playing a role there. So for me, the most interesting thing, since I dis we discovered this kind of stuff, uh, the seesaw pattern, how this can possibly happen in the lifetime of a single individual? What is happening with these histogram peaks getting closer or wider? from each other. So what we hypothesize right now is GBM is simply a, a transcription dependent mutation process. It's indiscriminate. It happens to anything which gets transcribed, right? So you start with a zygote, which is has like narrow range of methylation uh, ranges. And then throughout the organism, uh, you get a heterogeneity of uh, methylation states among cells, which creates those smooth peaks instead of like, you know, 0, 50%, 100% as it would be in a, a genotypic situation. So the peaks are smoothed over uh, methylation states across many cells. If so, we can imagine that uh, with cell age, more cell divisions, uh, maybe these peaks can get closer. The more methylation accumulates, the more diversity of methylation accumulates, the closer are the peaks. And if you do regeneration or rejuvenation, some sort of cell uh, turnover, this might get you uh, closer to the zygote state where everything is really nicely separated. And so you can, we can think of this process of peaks getting closer is uh, more diversity of methylation states among cells in the organism. Getting wider, it's less diversity of methylation states in the organism, which could be due to some sort of regenerative process. So that's the hypothesis. And we think that transcription affects methylation by itself. I mean, of course, it's a gene body methylation. It only found in transcribed regions. So it has to be transcription dependent. And environment might affect these two processes, which would result in uh, pigs getting either wider or narrower. So that's the hypothesis. And this is not about regulation. We don't really know exactly how uh, methylation of the C uh, affects the gene function. And it's quite possible that it's just like a muta any mutation. There is no particular effect, right? It's context dependent. It's like you don't ask what is the typical effect of mutation of C to T. It depends on where it happens, right? So likewise, it's quite possible that methylation also have these effects depending on where they happen. They basically create some sort of functional variation, which is probably relatively subtle compared to the base mutations. One thing they do, they actually promote base mutations. Methylated C is 10 times more likely to mutate to T than non-methylated C, one thing. Uh, but they could possibly affect the gene function by itself and it is possibly futile to try to look for a specific effect because it's a mutation. It depends on where it happens. Uh, and since it's a mutation, it's heritable and can be selected for, and that somehow results in your typical GBM across gene functions if you look across the genome. So, okay. Uh, hopefully your mind is sufficiently blown by now. So. Should we keep studying GBM in context of adaptation at all, if that's like this, if it's not a regulatory mechanism, it's just another type of mutation process? 
Uh, and I say, absolutely, yeah. Because it's possibly a source of selectable genetic variation that's focused on genes, not just anywhere in the genome. It's transcription dependent. It happens very rapidly, but it creates variation which can be selected and possible source of adaptive variation in populations. It may not directly regulate genes, but may rapidly introduce heritable variation in their function. So uh, this is the direction my lab is sort of looking towards right now. That's it. Evolution and genetics rules. Questions? <laughs>